and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Last time I took a look at a classic work of speculative fiction with Dune. This week I'm looking at a Western novelized look at a historical event in the, the novel and the historical novels thereof with Genpei by Kara Dalki. Genpei adapts the events leading up to the Genpei War and the war itself. The book can kind of loosely be considered an adaptation of the classic Japanese historical novel, The Tale of the Heiki, or Heiki Monogatari. To kind of explain the plot, I'm going to have to go into historical context somewhat. Well, by somewhat, I mean a lot. And also, because it's complicated to explain, I'll have to summarize and probably end up explaining anyway. I'm also going to mangle a lot, by which I mean all, of the names, so I beg for your forgiveness. Now, the events in the book are set during Japan's Heian period, during which time the imperial capital was in Heian Kyo, now known as Kyoto. During this time, there was a trend for emperors to retire and become Buddhist monks as they got older. However, these cloistered emperors would frequently retain their power and influence even after they'd officially retired from the cares of the world. Um... Basically, oh, I don't have to handle the day-to-day runnings of the court anymore, but I still want to actually run things, because power is slightly, slightly less addictive than spice, and generally has non-lethal withdrawal symptoms, but then again, you never know. It depends. Sometimes sometimes loss of power can to you. Um... And if hearing the sentence about the fact of the emperors retaining their political power after they'd retired led you to think, oh, that can't go well, then you have more foresight than most people in Han-era Japan who potentially could have stopped this. Um, in particular, the book goes a little bit beyond the Genpei War, rather a little before the Genpei War, to include two other wars that came before it. The, and here's where we get name mangling again, the Hogan Rebellion, with no Hulk Hogan, just, there's a line on top of the O, um, and the Heiji Rebellion. In the Hogan Rebellion, the war was brought on by a clash for power between a cloistered emperor, the former Emperor Sutoku, who the book and I will henceforth refer to as the Shin-in, and the new emperor, Emperor Go Shirakawa, who ascended the throne when the younger sitting emperor, Emperor Kanoe, died suddenly. The book doesn't exactly make it clear whether Kanoe's sudden death was an actual just tragedy of bad luck and fate, or whether it, or whether somebody schemed to have uh, Kanoe murdered. In any case, um, Sotoku didn't want Shirakawa in power, in part because other, the Shin'in could not manipulate Shirakawa, because um, Kanoe died at the age of 17, had been reigning for several years since then, with um, the Shin'in basically serving as a regent. While Shirakawa wanted the Shin'in, his brother, if I recall correctly, to basically go sought off and be a monk, like, you know, he intended to do. This led to the two main rival cl- two rival clans with significant amounts of political and military power, the Tiara and the or Taira and the Minamoto, each siding with one of the factions. The Minamoto with the Shin'in and then the Taira with Shirakawa. Shirakawa faction won, and the Shin'in was killed. Was he? And at this point, I'm going to stop with the history lesson, because if I keep this up, it will turn into a bad combination of extra credits history and crash course Japanese history with no budget and less cool drawings. And also a little bit less wit, because I'm I'm not as clever or witty as John Green, anyway. So at this point, we also get into the supernatural elements of the story, rather than you get into talking about them, because actually they got involved a little earlier. The book opens with... Tyra, with Taira no Kiyomori making a deal with the Dragon King, the kami who controls the sea around Japan and the patron of the Taira clan, um, to basically get Kiyomori's grandson on the imperial throne. However, in order for Kiyomori to get this, Kiyomori must also do something for the Dragon King, quid pro quo. Specifically, 
The Dragon King wants the sword Kusanagi. It's part of the three pieces of Imperial Japanese Imperial Regalia, one of which is a magic bead. Um, it's I forget the exact name of it, the Japanese name for it, but the shape looks like a nine uh, spiral shell bead and a mirror. Um, the sword was gifted to um, Prince Yamato, Yamato by the uh, Dragon King, and also has the power to control the winds. Um, this scene really says at the beginning that um, this is the way that this book is going to handle the supernatural, which is, it's real. Oni exist, yokai exist, uh, the kami are real. And those, those supernatural forces will be playing a major role throughout the events of the story. Which also leads to the book's real problem. There's a couple of them, but this is the big one. There are a lot of characters in this book who are skeptical when they really, really shouldn't be about the supernatural. Probably the worst example of this is Kaio Mori itself. Um, because the Shinin is not dead. Well, I mean, he's dead, but he's also undead. He has made himself a undead, a Oni, to basically have a mortal life and to go forth and seek revenge on, every, on everyone in Japan for kicking him out of power. The Shinin is not the nice person. Um, and, well... When people try to bring this up to Kaiomori, he refuses to believe it exists. There's no such thing as ghosts. Even when the person bringing up that he should be worried about the Oni of the Shin-In, or that, that, that Kiyomori should be worried about the Oni of the Shin-In, is the Dragon King. Kiyomori's like, ah, ghosts don't exist. When a Kami, a genius Loki of you of the sea and the patron of your clan is telling you something telling you about a supernatural force that you should be worried about normally the right thing to do is listen you go oh okay because generally my assumption is that supernatural beings are fairly knowledgeable of super about the supernatural forces that are at their control and other forces have at their control, especially when you're dealing with a kami or other god figure. Similarly, other characters encounter, de encounter Tengu, um, or Oni in the form of the Shin-In, but they don't believe in Tengu, or they don't believe in Kami. It's... it's weird. In a narrative, from a narrative standpoint, it reminds me of a character concept I've encountered a few times in Dungeons and Dragons. Brought up by players, it's the concepts they want to play, and they can be an interesting challenge when it actually comes across as kind of stupid. And this character concept is this: I am going to play a character in Dungeons and Dragons game who does not believe in deities, not does not worship deities, but does not believe in deities. Now, in some settings, this works. Um, if you're running a pre-War of the Lands. Um, Dragonlance campaign this works. In Dark Sun this works definitely. There's very little divine spell casting. I believe in second edition there are no divine casters for this class. Uh, Ravenloft as well. There's very little divine force in the in Ravenloft. In fact, the influence of casters, of divine spell casters, is lessened. But if you're say doing this in Forgotten Realms, or even Greyhawk, then the actual divine beings of this world are much more actively involved in the events of the setting. And consequently, denying the existence of gods, when gods throw their weight around in the setting on a regular basis, and shape the very nature of the setting somewhat regularly, is a big stinking deal. And in the sense that it's really, really stupid. And it's the same thing kind of applies here. At best, it comes across like you're writing a character as being too dumb to live. 
At worst, he comes across as bad writing. To be fair, with the first option, some of these characters may have intentionally been written as trying to be too, being too dumb to live. Uh, Kiyomori, for example, plays Hardball with the Dragon King, the patron Kami of his clan, which screams stupid ideas. Um, this also leads me to the other kind of problem with Supernatural in here, which is the Sheen in himself, and how this relates to more sort of the, sh- the tone of the setting. The author's clearly trying to go for shades of gray. The problem is the Sheen in is pitch black. He is evil, pure and simple. He just wants to wreck chaos to throw, to keep Japan in turmoil. He doesn't care who wins. He just wants to just keep trashing stuff. Which causes the problem of whenever the Shinin allies with someone, where you're allied with a being of, of evil, and what, and th- that makes it harder for me to root for you. But there are characters on your side who are sympathetic. It'd be like if in Game of Thrones, where you had, well, the God Hand from Berserk or the actual devil showing up and supporting all three sides. It makes it hard for me to root for people if they're voluntarily receiving help from the devil. Now, if it was like a bunch of force characters on each side recognize, oh, that this is the devil and we're going to team up to fight against him, that'd be something else, but this isn't that. Um, and it says like, oh, so Shin is helping the, the Tyra, so I guess we most are the good guys, and certainly helped by the fact that Kiyomori is a right, proper bastard. Oh, jackass. He's a legitimate child. Um, so, it's easy for me to support the Minamoto. But then the Shinin starts supporting the Minamoto. And like, but Tiara are still bastards. But the Minamoto are being supported by the devil. So to speak, are supported by the by Noni. It, it causes problems. Still, the book is enjoyable. I'm glad I read it. I gave it a 3 out of 5 on Goodreads. It's a book which has some significant flaws, but is still an enjoyable read. I would say, if I recommendations for people watching this channel, um, or anime fans or whatever, if you enjoy anime series like Hakin, like the Hakinden or other period works, which aren't necessarily action works, you may enjoy this book. Just keep in mind that this book focuses more on political maneuvering over sorcery and sword fighting. All right, next time I'm going to try to put together another one of my um, top five lists. It's been a while since I did the last, not the top five, but my five lists. It's been a while since I did my last video on uh, tabletop role-playing games for people who like video games. I've got a list of five more v- games together, and I'll get into that in an, a fortnight. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please support my Patreon. The link is up here and also in the show notes. Supporting my Patreon will help me get shows out more often and generally make things more enjoy- get more enjoyable stuff out. And you also may get to influence my programming depending on what level you support. Other than that, if you like the show, like, subscribe on YouTube, and tell your friends. Thank you very much for watching. Once again, I will see you next time.